Well, we wanted to fix these, these fundamental problems. I don't think anybody says chemotherapy, the side effects are good enough for a lot of diseases like Alzheimer's. We've never had treatments which have any impact. And we have a lot of diseases which are coming back. I think that's why all of us go into computational biology at the start, benefits for human health. Today, for a drug to be discovered, the estimates I've seen are two and a half billion dollars, and on an average of about 15 years. Even with that investment of resources, over 90% of projects fail. We didn't, as a species, climb down from the trees and walk onto the savanna knowing how to do computational fluid dynamics. People had to invent those algorithms and those approaches to be able to deliver the kinds of efficiencies we have today. And so at Atomwise, we invented the idea of how to use deep neural networks for structure-based drug design. For a medicine to work, it has to stick to disease protein to turn it off. So concretely, what you need is for the molecule to stick to the intended target. We phrase that as a machine learning problem. You can classify molecules which are going to stick or fail to stick. We run the simulation instead of doing the test physically. And then when you do the physical test, you only have to do it in those cases you think are likeliest to work. We're delivering hit rates which are 10,000 times better. And we can do that at a rate which is 100 times faster compared to physical methods. We could give answers where all the previous techniques people had tried had failed. What stood out about Atomwise to us, the computer science is validated in in vivo studies. It has been further proven in blinded studies with actual pharmaceutical customers, and it's structure-based, so the very hardest targets can be reached with the best match. Getting medicines, which are safe and effective, to patients who, who need them. That's, at the end of the day, what success means for us and for all the people that we work with. Thanks, everybody. Uh, right, so at Atomwise, we help researchers discover new medicine. Um, we work with four of the top 10 US pharma companies, like Merck and AbbVie. We work with uh, global top agrochemical companies, like Monsanto. And, and having taken a look at their data that now we have access to, um, I, I can tell you that when we do these head-to-head -head comparisons, we're giving hit rates which are 10,000 times better than the physical screening methods. And I thought here it would be interesting um, for us uh, to look at the AI side of that, right? Because everybody, all the pharma companies uh, have robots and they all have test tubes and they all have chemists. And so we need something new to really accelerate the pace. Um, and so I'm, I phrase this as AI hype and hope as the title. Um, because there is a lot of hype out there, uh, let's, let's be clear. Um, you know, Andrew Ng talks about AI as the new electricity. Uh, Sundar uh, Chai, the CEO of, of Google, goes a step further and says it's more profound than fire. Um, and so I think it's interesting when we're phrasing things as, as the new when, if AI is the new electricity, to look back to when electricity was the new electricity. Um, because that was also an innovation. Uh, and it turned out that we had, for example, factories before we had electricity. And it took about 50 years to see productivity improvements, uh, the consequences of that from electricity. So, so factories look like this, and, and here's a depiction. And you can see that like, the major organizing principle of the factory was this bar on top. It's, it's a line shaft, and it's just an engineering solution for how you move power from the, from the boiler to the machine. Right? So the whole system had to be organized around this engineering constraint. And it took about 50 years for electricity to decouple the machine from the line shaft to where we could organize the whole uh, factory around the workflow, right? the, the job that needed to be done. And that's when you got the, the performance improvements from Henry Ford's assembly line. And one of my major themes is that those, capturing those productivity gains requires this redesign. And of course, that's, that's a change in, in our thinking. And thinking, takes, uh, thinking changes much, much slower than technology changes. Right? So we have to be on the lookout for these things, which I think is, is why we're here in this room. Um, the way that plays out in pharma is it's kind of the last industry where you build a prototype and then go test that prototype. If you went to Airbus or Lockheed Martin or Boeing and said, I've got this great idea, we're going to design a new airplane, I'm going to build a thousand options and I'm going to throw them off this cliff, and we'll just see which ones fly. It will work, but they won't let you do it. 
right? They'll say that is way too laborious and way too expensive. And so instead what they do is they simulate a thousand wings and only when the computer says wing number 206, it will fly, it will be fuel efficient, it will be quiet, a dozen other factors, you go build that, that airplane. Um, and this is true if you're building power plants and it's true if you're building cars and it's true, uh, you know, I'm in San Francisco now, I'm, I'm fairly confident the building will stand up in an earthquake even though it's expensive to run that test physically. And so our, uh, our version of that is, is taking AI and moving the testing before you have to build the prototype. Because if you look at it, if you took somebody working in a lab a hundred years ago, they would find the lab today pretty familiar, possibly depressingly familiar, right? Uh, test tubes have not substantively changed since the time of Louis Pasteur. And that may be part of the reason why uh, we need more work. So this was a review from a review article by the New England Journal of Medicine on the top 10 cause of death, you know, when they started and when they were 100 years on. So you can see that we've done pretty well in infectious disease. We've knocked those out. But we have a lot of, of death left to go um, and a lot, you know, of progress, I think, that we'd all like to see. And for that, again, I think we need these, these new technologies. So concretely what I'm talking about is for a drug to work, as you heard in the video, it needs to stick to the disease protein to turn it off. Uh, here in yellow, you see one of the oldest chemotherapies. This is methotrexate. Um, and you can see that it just uh, is occupying the site in the protein, uh, and that shuts down the, the protein and, and blocks that disease process. So if you want to design the next generation of the chemotherapy, you'd want something that binds in there very, very tightly, sticks very potently, so you have to use very little of the drug. You also want to make sure that it binds this protein and not a hundred other proteins in your body and causes all kinds of side effects. And I think that question of very small changes in shape or charge or lipophilicity or, or, or whatnot, chemical structure, has huge impacts in terms of binding affinity is actually very intuitive for all of us. So the question is easy to understand. It's how you get that productivity. Um, and here I want to turn to a second principle, which is uh, kind of like what uh, Vinod was talking about he, when he, he mentioned the doctors for the other 99% of people. So when I look at AI, um, there's this, this interesting principle, which is today you can get superhuman performance. That's possible, but it's really hard. <laughs> um, on the other hand, getting uh, fast or cheap, getting infinite humans for nearly free, that we can talk about with AI much, much easier. And so com you know, combines were a great advance but we had this earlier technology which worked you know, reasonably well uh, to deliver um, value. And the way that this plays out, this, this what, do, what would you do conceptually, mentally, if you had infinite humans, plays out like this for pharma. So it used to be the case that big pharma had an advantage in how many molecules they had in-house. So you had medicinal chemists building molecules all day long, testing them and sending them to the freezers. And so that the next time when you started a new disease, you had a huge pool to draw from. And in fact, uh, Big Pharma sort of topped out around 5 million molecules, what you could store in the warehouses, what you, could, what you could test. And that meant that if you took the whole sum of everything that the people in this room could buy, they had more molecules. They had a better chance of finding something and then iterating your way to success. That's changed. What you're seeing here is that there's three quarters of a billion molecules that we can go on the web today and order up and they get to you in four to six weeks. This should be absolutely terrifying to any big pharma company because the thing which was a strategic advantage, having invested in massive armies of medicinal chemists, no longer helps you that much. Instead of synthesis being the limiting factor because of the huge amount of growth, both just technologically and our capabilities for, for synthesis, but also in uh, chemical uh, capacity in places like India, China, Belarus, Ukraine, we actually, anybody here in the room has access to enough molecules to find starting materials. This also is one of these things where it's good news, bad news, it's same news. Um, so this also points out why the challenge of searching or the challenge of AI becomes the appropriate linchpin. Because in a world of three quarters of a billion molecules, if you're guaranteed to find the right answer, but you have a 1% false positive rate, right, then that answer is lost in a sea of molecules, more molecules than you can ever test. And so this is the reason, why, I think, why computational technologies uh, 
always underperformed historically and why we need exceptional accuracy in uh, the technological capabilities. Fortunately, we're here at University of Toronto where we, you know, the world invented deep learning, more or less, uh, <laughs> to first order approximation. Um, and so here the idea is, is pretty simple, um, where deep learning, uh, classically for image recognition, is you're, you're putting pic a two-dimensional grid of pixels where every pixel has red, green, and blue uh, ch color channels into a neural network, and, and you're uh, predicting what the uh, network is looking at. Uh, at Atomwise, we took that idea and we moved into three dimensions. So instead of a 2D grid of pixels, we have a 3D grid of voxels, and every voxel, instead of red, green, and blue, we have carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen. And that means that everything that Jeff and Jan and Yoshio and the rest invent, we get to steal and apply for the benefit of mankind in uh, discovering new drugs. So here's a, a, an example, and we talked about explainability. Here's my version of it, which is um, you can pick up, an, these networks are, are notoriously difficult to understand what they're doing. And so you pick up a neuron and say, hey, neuron 42, what maximally activates you in the input? And you can see this box that's drawn around these orange and red sticks. So the orange and red sticks are called a sulfonyl group. It shows up, it's a, it's a um, typical, uh, hey, okay. It's a, it's a typical um, uh, functional group, shows up in a lot of uh, antibiotics. And we never labeled this for the system. The system has statistically derived this from raw data. And it said, here is something that actually predicts binding or non-binding. I had to do several semesters of organic chemistry to get that, right? But it has done it uh, in a purely statistical way. And it's such a reasonable pattern that we have a name for it, the sulfonyl group. So um, what can we do with that? So here's some data which describes uh, work that had been done at big pharma companies over the better part of a decade uh, across many, uh, pro uh, many different disease targets. Uh, and this line, this green line, the one nanomolar line, that's sort of the boundary between everything to the left of that is not potent enough, is not going to be a drug. The things to the right have a chance. So you can see that the vast majority, the vast majority of effort, and each one of these points was, was somebody physically building, uh, you know, spending time huffing solvent and like building molecules, you can see that the vast majority of, um, of, of work was never going to play out. Uh, this is experimental data, what was observed. And then when I put against that predicted on the y-axis, you can see just by eye a fantastic correlation between uh, the neural network's predictions and experimental measurements. But more than that, if I direct your attention up here to the upper right, that false positive rate we've taken care of. And so if AtomNet says it's going to be potent, it's actually going to be potent. Like Those are worth spending your time on. And you can eliminate, as you can see, just the vast majority of these individual points. I want to point out how hard this is to do. Um, so, so here's a general problem in artificial intelligence. Here's, here's Mickey interacting with artificial intelligence, where Mickey says, hey, I need, I need to clean the house. But the way he phrases it is, get me water. And he succeeds, right? Like the system succeeds in getting him water. But it turns out that that's not what he wanted. There are a whole factor of other constraints that he wanted on this thing that weren't phrased exactly correctly. And in fact, it was a terrible outcome. Uh, we recently published a paper. This is how it looks in ours. If you Google, the title of the paper was the aggressively titled uh, Most Ligand-Based Classification Benchmarks Reward Memorization Rather Generalization. And so I won't go into the details, but, but those correlations that you see are basically showing every machine learning method we looked at here. I'm showing random forest, logistic regression, uh, support vector machines, and one nearest neighbor. You can see that performance gets better according to this very simple bias term, which is not measuring the thing you want. And so basically, this result, which, which grew out of a collaboration with Merck, where we were looking at internal Merck data, um, showed that large portions of the field of computational chemistry are meaningless and have been done wrong. And so we need to go back and redo them as a field. So this is, you know, getting those results that I showed you uh, is incredibly challenging because phrasing what you want out of these machine learning systems is sort of the linchpin of getting them right. So it's important not just to end on on those, but actually to go forward and, and get discovery. So here's a perm that we we're doing with Scripps down in San Diego on botulinum neurotoxin. It's the most acutely lethal toxin known to mankind, like a bottle cap would kill everybody on the planet kind of thing. Um, 
And the, the best compounds that this lab, after you know, experts in the world working for years, had come up with were these heavy metal treatments, chelated copper compounds, which, like, if you look at the presentations, half the presentations on how, no, no, it's fine, we won't kill the patient before we cure the patient kind of results. So kind of like chemotherapies. Um, and, and in that case, you wanted something which was going to be much more potent than we had, uh, than we had available to us, and also much more medchem friendly, a much better medicine. And so this, uh, this arc that I'm showing on the right hand side of the slide uh, gave those improved potency above what, what expert humans had been able to deliver after years of working on it. This was all run by the computer. The computer was picking each of these compounds. So it's not that there's a human in the loop here. It's, it, it is really doing the judgments and the incorporation of the new, of the new data. There's another piece. This is multiple sclerosis uh, example. Um, and I'll skip the details and just show the results because I think that's what's important. Um, this is in vivo studies where, you know, I call this the happy mouse, dead mouse slide. Um, for, and it's not dead. It's just showing the classic symptoms of multiple sclerosis, the, the dragging hind limbs and the limp tail, the nice statistical separation. But, like, this is what you have to show to convince the biologists, right? They don't care about the, the deep learning stuff, right? This is the results that you have to show. But again, this was picked entirely by the computer. There was not human adjudication during this process. And this is for a target, which is a protein-protein interaction. It's a target in the central nervous system. If you go ask your, you know, your favorite medicinal chemist about the, the challenge of those, those are absolutely greenfield opportunities that, that as a species we don't have consistent ways of going after protein-protein interactions. Beyond that, this was one which was a novel binding site. And so we had we had no information on what would work, no competitor patents, no high throughput screening results, no endogenous ligand, no natural product to build from, right? So really, the computer looked at this protein and was like, I think these will work. And we found this result in the top 50 molecules. Instead of having to look through the 750 million molecules. And we're... We're rolling that out. So uh, this year we've got, um, we're going to hit 100 projects. Uh, that's an incredibly high number, especially in biotech. Uh, we have them in, in these disease areas, among others, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, many different cancers, uh, drug-resistant antibiotics, and so on. And in fact, we made this uh, program available to, to the world where uh, academics can come to us and say, hey, I think protein X will cure Alzheimer's, and we will screen uh, millions of molecules, we'll pick the top, we'll buy the top of the list, we'll quality control, we'll plate and we'll send it to them for free. Um, that might sound surprising in, maybe to the economists, I don't know. Um, but there's a number of things that we get out of it. Um, first, and, and in particular I'll focus on the, the machine learning side of it, which is uh, having the first data point on a new protein is much, much more valuable than having the millionth and first data point on a, a well-studied kinase. And so academics are always pushing out into the new, the weird, the, the unusual, and the cutting edge. And so that is a skew of the data which is filling out and making every project we work on more robust. So for me, that's very valuable. The other piece of it is, if you want to look at it from business model side, we're filling our sales pipeline before there's a company, right? We're there before day zero when these things spin up. And so uh, this is a way of having early access to cutting-edge technology.